Hello, welcome to Show Studio. This is the last of the new series of Head to Head. We have now moved into Paris and I'm very, very lucky to conclude this series with the great Stephen Jones again. Oh, thank you, my who dear. Who looks dapper and punkish and very modern today. <laughs> like, tell us a little bit about this crochet hat. Well, this was um, t-shirt and a birthday present from my husband which is sort of American trash rock and roll t-shirt and um, a 1930s evening headdress hat, um, which would sh fit on your shingled hair, made uh, crocheted out of gimp. Beautiful. Did you, did you find it in a um, I found it in flea an antique market, shop. Yeah. in an antique yeah. shop, yeah. Yeah. yeah, amazing. Yeah. Great. So let's go into Paris. Um, and what are you wearing? Uh, I'm wearing a Stella McCartney jacket, actually. In but very pretty green. Quite, yeah, it has shorts, cut like trousers. I'm not wearing them because I was much younger when I bought it, so it's quite vintage, but I still love it. You won't see it, but it's green like my <laughs> eyes. So. Oh. Okay, so Paris, um, enough about us. Um, Paris concludes a very interesting month. Uh, and Paris was, I think, particularly dense and interesting this season. I mean, dense in quantity of things to mm -hmm. see and, and follow and, and watch. Uh, very interesting about a, a very clear shift into, fa and, you know, from fashion. First of all, I've seen a lot of flowers, a lot of love, a lot of romanticism, a lot of reaction to the gloomy time, political time we're living in. Sure. And yeah. by the way, Paris with the gilet jaune, you know, it's yeah, probably it's still continuing. Everybody thought it would be exactly. finished at Christmas time, but it's no, continuing. It's going on, every right. ça continue, mm -hmm. yes. And, um, but I, what I particularly love is that I could see it already a little bit in New York, in Milan, in London, etc. but Paris definitely brought back elegance mm -hmm. and addressing in a more formal way. Everybody did it, including, you know, them, not Balenciaga. I mean, we, we saw it everywhere and we saw some very, very interesting collection. We saw some political collection and we'll go into it with Ray and Comme des Garçons was like almost shouting about our anger. Um, and we saw, I mean, of course, we will have to talk about Chanel because the, 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 the you know, the main thing was the absence of Karl and his last collection and mm -hmm. this almost homage to his work that happened at Chanel, by the way, probably one of the few Chanel collections that I really loved. Um, and had his turn around, had his Celine, U-turn yeah. at Celine. Um, there were not many surprises about probably Hedy. Uh, Nicolas Gesquier at Louis Vuitton, who built a museum in the museum. We can have a chat about that. But let's start from where do you want to start? Well, I think it has to be um, Chanel. Carl yeah. at Chanel. And it was the last collection he designed. Um, I don't know so much about the intimate details of this, but I know, it, for example, when he was at Fendi, that he just died shortly before that, and even to a few days before he died, he was phoning Sending through in instructions notes. and notes and things. So that was extraordinary. And of course, Chanel uh, had been sort of helped by Virginie over the past sort of few seasons, and certainly she Virginie came out. Virginie Viard is number yeah. two, who's now in charge. Sorry, and that's for the sake of the audience. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it was a great collection. But I think no matter how the collection had looked, uh, you couldn't help but feel that this was an end of an era and maybe the beginning of another one, but actually we thought it was the end of an era. Well, and then again, fashion-wise, is it? Because by giving the job to uh, Virginie Viard, Chanel is telling us business as usual. I mean, that's as much as usual it can be without Carla around, but she worked with him for 30 years. Yes. Absolutely. It, it, I'm not, I don't think she will do an Alessandro Michele at Gucci. She will probably more do, I don't find the example, a, 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 um, a McQueen, um, a Sarah thing, you know, like mm -hmm. a continuation and then little by little bringing her own, her own hands taste, in it. Yes. But this collection to me, for me, was definitely designed still by Carl yeah, and was definitely designed by Carl who knew he was going. Um, it was obviously 
ill. He didn't suddenly die of a heart attack. And it's like the greatest hits of what he's done at Chanel. And I think it's probably his most modern collection. And certainly there was an ease to it. Satan, but that's but what I see. The, the winnie, there was an ease to it, and he wasn't experimenting with unusual proportions or something. It was quite classic in a way, but because it was quite classic and simple, that's why it looked contemporary and easy to yeah. wear, and I guess that denotes modern at the moment. It's like, like, what the heck? I do what I want because yeah. this is what people, what I want people to remember me for, and it's quintessentially Chanel, yeah. but it's also quintessentially Karl Lagerfeld, I think. But, you know, you, you see the clothes and then you saw the set as well, which was this wonderful Alpine village. Yes. And the set is just Back as impressive. Back to his origin, you know, it was a bit Swiss, a bit German, a bit where he comes from. But it was, the set was as impressive as the clothes, and you just think this is a particular time in fashion and a particular way of showing, which is not going to happen again and is now over. And it has been that way for 30 years since he's been there at Chanel. Um, he definitely I, invented the, uh, the incredible set. Yeah, I mean, other, pe other people had a, a go at doing it, but I think that was the background to the season. There were lots of other things going on. I mean, for, for example, probably the, one of the most noteworthy were, was Hedy's collection at Celine. Uh, Can I just say one second yeah, here sure. still, because I really need to mention the music of this show that added emotion to emotion, and it was from Philly Glass to Heroes, and mm -hmm. Heroes was Carl's apparently favorite song by David Bowie, and mm -hmm. they played it also. Michel Gobert played Michel it also Go at yeah. the end of Fendi, yeah. so that was like the reminder, but I think Philip Glass at the beginning was even more mm -hmm. emotionally, emotion-inducing. Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, sorry I interrupted you, but I really needed to mention this. Yeah, I think the it's very interesting because I've worked with Michelle for many years and he also does the music for Dior and many yeah. other houses and for J.W. Anderson. Yeah. And it's extraordinary how music can really set the mood and the place and yeah, influence you whether... the greatest. What ...make you think, is that a good collection or a bad collection? Yeah. Um, coming on to Celine. Okay, this let's, let's go to really the, the big turnaround. turn of of Hedy. So my idea is, and then we'll talk about the collection, did we like it or not, but my idea is that Hedy last season said to Anthony Vaccarello and the world, this is my look. What you're doing today at Saint Laurent, I made it first. And I want everybody to know, this is my look. And this time he said to us, I know that I'm working for Celine, and I know what I need to do, and I will be the one who reinvented the French bourgeois. That's how I read it. I mean, certainly... How do you read it? Certainly, if any designer could come up with a plan like that, well, it would be him. <laughs> he had a strategy. Because he's a genius. It's not by mistake. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. For whatever reason it happened, it, it did, and he got not particularly positive reviews last season, and people sort of loved it this season, just because it was a very interesting point of view. For me, personally, with this sort of look, it's, you know, when I came to London in 1976, this was the look that existed yeah. within the world of Sloan Rangers, yeah. um, yes. and that's why punk was invented, was against something like, like this, this yeah. which was about bourgeois values, but that was, ancient history and a very different point of view and people don't think like that but actually you know, a, a beige pleated skirt culotte culottes mm -hmm. um, has a whole range of connotations for me but for somebody who's 18 or 20 or whatever they've never experienced clothes like this before so well, it's funny you say that because I was discussing this with my colleagues this morning who are all it's very, very much Prince younger. Diana, it's the very Diana Princess around. of Wales it's very Diana <laughs> yes. Princess I mean look at the little blouse it's with a little the, bit with Frencher the... than that I think it's more French than British bourgeois do you see do you see some English? Well, maybe mm -hmm. because I didn't know it as well, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, I mean, one thing about this collection is the more I look at it, the more I like it. Uh, my first, maybe because I was busier being shocked by what was going on, I was, I, I didn't, there are some looks in here that I really love. What I want to say, and uh, again, you know, Hedy has enemies and friends, and I'm trying to be objective here. 
He's very, very clever. Yeah. And one thing he has is that he has an eye for what is going to be on trend. And by on trend, I mean what people will want. And we've seen it in the past season a little bit, this going towards this dressing up in a classic way. Mm -hmm. And as you said, for the young people, this is completely new. It's not for us, but for the young people it is. So, I mean, there are some looks here, you know, the one with jeans thrown in with those beautiful, beautiful boots yeah. that are extremely modern, extremely cool. Yeah. And yet it's a jacket, a sweater, a pair of jeans. So again, he gave us clothes, Yeah, jeans. which is the new trend, is giving us clothes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, he but, did it you know, a, in a, a very shirt, focused way. A shirt under a jumper is such a look. Um, yeah, I, wear, I so, wear this every day. <laughs> I'm so fascinated to see whether this goes for summer 2020, because the summer version of this look is almost Laura Ashley. Oh, God forbid. Well, Sorry, yes, Laura. but that little collar, it becomes a little floral. Yeah, I think and a little bit of lace. Do, uh, Laura yes, I know, but that's why I find it so. I don't think he's going to do Laura Ashley, but how this transitions into a summer look, really tricky, because of course in the winter you can do a, a flight jacket like this with the with tweeds. A, with skirt. the tweeds. But in the, the summer yeah. you can't. No, but you know, I, I trust the great Hedisley man yeah. to come up with some incredible solution. Yeah. And talking about great designers, I would like, even if it was at the very end, I would like to talk about uh, Nicolas Jesquier at right. um, Louis Vuitton. The last show of the season, or is Mimi the last show of the season? No, I think now it's Vuitton. Yeah, yeah. I think it ended with Vuitton, but anyway, one or the other, and there, I think this was the last. So, um, first very different ad, uh, advice on building the Boubour, uh, five minutes from the Boubour in the Louvre. What do you think about that? Obviously, they've got a lot of money. <laughs> so... There you go. <laughs> so they can do, do something like that. Um, <gasps> I'm a little bit tired of this building Tour Eiffel's into the Grand Palais and Bobourg's into the Louvre and I'm bigger than you or my company has more money than yours, my show costs more than yours. I mean, Nicolas Jusquier is one of the best designers, he's probably the best designer of his generation. At the peak of his career at Balenciaga, he was delivering minimal small shows with the best fashion mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and the mm -hmm. best yeah, creations yeah, yeah, and yeah. the best creativity. Why does he do that? I mean, we could talk for the many, many, many <laughs> minutes about, uh, many hours about Go what ahead. he's doing. I want to hear what he's doing at the moment. Um, I think this is a, a conundrum. That obviously, v what Vuitton sells is actually leather goods, mm -hmm. and not clothes at all. Not even I mean, I don't, I, they sell canvas with LV on it. Yeah, and especially. what percentage of their toner comes from clothes? So in a way, financially, what he's showing for clothing does not matter, doesn't affect the bottom line. However, it really affects mm, the perception, because perception of the brand. It desirability of the brand. Yeah, and I think probably what he doesn't want to do is fall into the trap of doing something different every season. I think he wants to sort of make it newsworthy somehow. I didn't dislike the collection at all. I mean, again, you know, I've been there, I've been in the 80s, I've been watching, binge watching, re-watching, desperately seeking Susan and dressing like this. So for me, it's like, whoa, it's a little bit of an eye shock. Mm -hmm. But there are some pieces in this collection that they're absolutely fantastic and I can see the genius of Nicola. Um, I just don't think it needs all the Shabadan around it. It's almost distracting me because oh, yes. I'm so angry about the Boubou in the Louvre that I can't even put my... F and, and he was, I mean, in, he was very clever. And another one who's very clever in his interviews, he was saying, I wanted to shock, I wanted to give you ugly to see Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was, he was very clear about he that. Was and very it was clear so, about and it. it was so interesting, the fact that defensive. he said all those things. He said, I want to do something which was ugly. I want to channel ugliness. I wanted to make ugly clothes. And he did it the, 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 I think he even said something like that people didn't, don't want to wear or something. I can't remember what he said, but... But also he said something very... It's a little bit like Vivian, need, yeah, I, somehow, I, saying, you know, I've shown these collections, but yes, you shouldn't, but you shouldn't be buying clothes. There's something about one side him showing ugliness, but actually most people 
want to buy clothes to make themselves look better. Yeah. Yeah, but if this ugly is dictated by Nicolas Jasquier, people will feel beautiful in that. Mm -hmm. And I get it, and I understand, and also, Ugly looks different than that to me. Yeah, I mean, when we think of ugliness, also we think of what Prada did, what exactly. Mucha Prada, and she channeled and, this and idea Nicholas of ugliness and made a, obviously a whole language. Mucha, she invented the ugly mm -hmm. that is actually beautiful. Mm -hmm. But it's not that, it's the fact that I think, I think this is a very strong connection. There is a strong point of view, probably stronger than in the past two or three seasons. And I would have preferred it on a white catwalk, but that's just me being a little bit probably moralistic no, about I th I think spending I, money. I, I, I think you're correct, and I think that visually, when we look at the images now, it's very interesting to see how that complexity of clothes works against the, the complexity of the background. I know that they're only still images, but it doesn't. I feel it doesn't work because of the, because it'd be great if they were silhouetted on a very simple background so you could see exactly what was going on with the clothes. That would be a better balance. Yeah, but also, you know, it, for me it's like, I mean, it does work because the Boubourg was the symbol of the same area and it was like refused by people in Paris. I was like, oh my God, my God, what did they do, you know? And I think it's still one of the nicest pieces of architecture of that time. But, so probably he couldn't have the Boubourg, so well, well I built the Boubourg. And that's what disturbs me. It's very consistent with the collection, mm -hmm. but I no, wish completely. it was in the Boubourg. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. the Centre Georges Pompidou. And the extraordinary thing is, in, in the, at the same time, they were going to pull down Covent Garden and Soho in the late 60s, early 70s, to make it like the centre of Paris, because basically they pulled down what? the centre of medieval Paris in order to build the Beauborg. They pulled down what oh, they was considered yeah, to be of slums. Course. Yeah, and they wanted to do the same thing with Covent Garden and East Soho I at that time. Yeah, absolutely. To build what? To build a whole new area, to build museums, to have piazzas, to have modernist buildings and skyscrapers. But was, was the Paris there at the time as incredible as Covent Garden and so hard for London today. How Paris was where the bubble, it was, was more like the, the roads surrounding it, it was medieval. Yeah. It was like the Marais. Yeah, which like still exists. Which still exists in this beautiful one. I lived expensive. in the Marais for yeah. a year. Yeah. But, um, so, okay, shall we move on? It's sort of, you know, there's a, a certain <laughs> new waveness about this, which I, I love, um, and I can imagine if I was in the Palace in 1983 or in the Privilege Club, um, I would have died to have some clothes like this. Mm. Mm. I want them now. You have to talk because I'm eating exceptionally. I was thinking <laughs> that she could be Farida Kelfa, same hairdo, <laughs> um, who of course same. became Azadine's muse and yeah. was a very favorite model of Jean-Paul Gaultier back in the day. And she's still Said grandpa here, yeah, by Let's the way. move on, let's move on. I would like to, I mean, how can we not uh, mention what John did for Margiela again? You know, John being in better form every season. Mm -hmm. um, John delivering um, collections that are just incredible. And which makes me think about something that I didn't say at the beginning and I should have said there's also a lot in the new ready to wear that it's picked up by couture. And that's also a trend that John started two or three seasons ago with his first podcast where mm -hmm. he was speaking about, and I think he did it for a men's collection. He said, I'm putting the same techniques that I found in couture into ready to wear, to make them wearable. And he's gone and on and on and going, and now everybody is sort of picking up on that great mm -hmm. idea that, as usually, came from John Galliano. Yeah, um, but what was extraordinary about this last season, it was about print and color, uh, well, actually, for the, for the artisanal collection, it was about print and color oh, uh, for the That's couture. Amazing, yeah, yeah well, it was art, the, what they call the artisan collection. Artisan, they don't yeah. call it haute couture. No, you're right, but I was, you know, I'm yeah. trying to make it simpler for our audience. Yeah, but, but yeah, a very artisan. big difference between haute couture and the artisan. Artisan is really about being handmade and cutting things together and things which have got sort of rawness. Haute couture is about very much about that sort of refinement and elegance and silk mm. and everything. But I thought it was a fantastic collection because suddenly it was all taupe, olive, black, yeah, very navy, yeah. very discreet. 
very far away from sportswear right. and very far be away from pop culture. Streetswear and pop culture, but yeah. the tailoring, yeah. the ideas in, in this new yet classic way of tailoring, I mean, and also again, desirable, sellable, wearable clothes. And I sound like a broken record, but this is what we need to mm -hmm. move on, you know? Yeah. We need reality. Yeah, I hope uh, the, the company and everything is okay. You know that it, Diesel, who yeah. own yeah, um, Margiela, only, only the Brave, only yeah. the Brave um, went, has gone bankrupt in America. Only the Brave or Diesel? Diesel. I mean, Okay, yeah, which but is the cash cow. Yeah, yeah, which is a for the huge, group. huge business. So I hope everything's okay. Um, well, I, I, think, I think if contrary. someone can save a bit of it, it's yeah. John, because yeah. he's doing such an incredible job. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and thank you for, for putting attention back on cut and tailoring and, and real Absolutely, clothes. and there's a certain discretion and elegance to all these clothes, which is... Wonderful, looks charming. Yeah. Um, talking about uh, doing more sellable and wearable clothes, um, Rick Owen. Right. So Rick Owen said, I am so tired of this gloom and people being upset about what's going on. I am upset too, but just people deal with it. And so I give you glamour. And he came out with a collection that was very uh, Rick Owen, Rick Owenian. Mm -hmm. Um, yet, moving away from his weird way, you know, his difficult clothes mm -hmm. that are beautiful but difficult yeah. to wear, it's yeah. like, uh, have it a look at this. It wasn't women I mean, being suspended upside down on no, another outfit. It was women very elegantly dressed and beautiful with amazing clothes and that they still talked about uh -huh. him. And For Rick, color, this, yeah, is, yeah, this is a writing. major, I and mean, this is... Um, for him, quite unusual. There's very little black, um, but a, a great show. And he is a fantastic designer. And he really is a designer's designer. Um, it's a bit like Comme des Garcons. If you ask any designer who their favorite designers are, they'll say Yves Saint Laurent, Rick Owens, Ray Kaukuba. Mucha Prada. Mucha Prada. There's, there's yeah, different, yeah, yeah. But yes, I mean, of course, Rick mm -hmm. Owens yeah. is out there with them. But I thought, I thought, I wanted to tell Rick, please keep being in this good mood and keep being glamorous because... Because in a way it's more really understandable. Yeah. This is one of the best shows that Paris has given us, mm -hmm. I think. And it's more understandable. That's a very good point, yeah. yes. And fashion has to mirror the times uh, or deal with whatever's going on. And there's a certain friendliness about this um, in comparison to his normal shows and with everything that's going on in the world which is very fractious at the moment this was somehow a harmonious collection yeah this is uh, romantic and i Cohen, yeah. right and talking about romantic what does the word romantic make you think of Ooh, a big pink flower <laughs> no, i no, think about talk. valentino i think about the great um Pier Paolo piccioli who's the man of the Absolutely, well, the man of the moment. The flavor yeah. of the moment. Yeah, the yeah, moment. yeah. And yeah. again, he delivered, and again, people were crying, and again, he had a standing ovation. He's yeah. really, really... He's really on a roll. And I have to make a comment here. He had great hats here made by Noel Stewart. Um, okay. Which is the yeah, first... Yeah, they're talking about the hats, but they're really good. First time that they've worked together, as far as I know, and um, they were really good, and they had a clarity of purpose, and oh, technically... first time they worked together. So yeah. who did the previous big hat? Philip... Tracy, Tracy had, but so maybe um, Noel is going to be doing the pret-a-porter, but uh, whichever way, it was great to see these hats with them. I, I, I was delighted. Um, but yeah, and a really, really accomplished collection so with fantastic did, colors. And it did for the second time the collaboration with Yun Takahashi, yeah. and, uh, and he had these, um, he, he put these prints that Yun designs of, of I think they're neoclassical statues making love or kissing, I mean, being lovers. And he put them on, on, on some of the garments, mm -hmm. creating these very modern looks. Yeah. Um, 
And I love the fact that they continue. You know, it worked last season, and, and it, it, it's 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 going on. It's not just one off. Well, it's funny because you know, quite often he's done collaborations. Like he did a collaboration with Zandra Rhodes a few years yeah. ago. Do you remember that? Exactly, when he used yes. her prints. Um, but often it exists only for one season. It's going but, on. They love each other, yeah, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> And, uh, and also the other thing that I notice and, and, and it's showing us how good a designer he is, is that he was the first one to do these gigantic volumes. You remember last season also the hair. Now everybody and, does gigantic and now, volumes. And, and he moved closer to the body. I yeah, mean, the yeah. volumes are much uh, less there. I mean, it's, uh, there's textures, there's fabrics, there's mm -hmm. everything is short and long and, and those typical Valentino by Pierpaolo beautiful shapes, you know, like this look, even when it's completely covered, it's sexy and he's the mm -hmm. master of that. Yeah. And I thank him for that. Um, but now that everybody's doing gigantic coats, it's like, okay, done that, been yeah. there, yeah. let's move on. Let's move on. on. Yeah. And it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's great. Should we talk about uh, Comme des Garçons? Yeah, Comme let's Garçons go to Comme des Garçons. was an extraordinary collection. Um, and it was very, very, very angry, very political. You know, it was a stomping down and saying enough is enough. Yeah, and quite yeah, a big show. I mean, I wasn't show. there, but that's what I, that's what I read. And a big show, much bigger yeah. than usual, yeah. right? But I remember when I first worked with her like 30 years ago, she used to have, you know, show 80 outfits and there were, you know, the girls changed three times and it was... Doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very, very different. She, she stopped doing that. Um, and this wasn't right back there, but an extraordinary collection as well, which were, in a way, within the lexicon of Comme des Garçons, much more wearable clothes too. And I think those real Comme des Garçons fans out there will all go and buy those outfits. Because sometimes, obviously, over the past, say, four years or five years, the clothes have been fairly unwearable. Because they're too big. I mean, they or... were sculptors. They were they were symbol of something. Yeah, but yeah. Then you know, then it's very clever because if you go to any Dover Street the market, market, you see the most a, beautiful, yeah. beautiful right mainline because it's the best. And that black blazer. I mean, it's not what you see on the catwalk. But yeah, there's and, a lot and even the main collection, even not. Yeah, the crazy e one. E even not the more sort of diffusion collections. Mm. The main collection is of exquisitely made, beautiful black yeah. dresses. Um, but this is great because it's actually joined all those different things together and had the elegance and had the wearability, but had the creativity as well and the point of view. There's no doubt that Ray is the greatest. I mean, the greatest mm -hmm. is one of the greatest of, of fashion for the past X years. But um, Again, you know, I have this feeling that everybody's taking out the bed. It's as if there's been so much and there's been this run to Instagrammable thing and this run to who's the biggest, who's the better, that everybody now is at their best. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. like a stimulus to take out not sitting on your own success and saying, you know what, I can do even better. And this was just an amazing show. But I think it's in the political background of what's going on at the moment, people think, what can I do? What's really me? What what means something to me? What point of view do I want to express? Do you and think people are thinking also, what can I sell? Because yeah, there's but a I, lot, and it's difficult for everybody to sell as much. But I think it, it has got so bad about what can I sell. For example, the state of department store of the United States, independent boutiques, every, every, everything that's going wrong within the fashion business. It might be, well, we're not selling, it's very difficult to sell clothes now, so what do we do the best? What's the essence of what I do? Because if I go out, if something goes wrong, I want to be doing it fantastically well. And I think somehow that, you know, adversity channels people's minds That's into it. positivity. That's and, what I wanted to say, yeah. And that's why that was a, a, a real engine for making beautiful and creative clothes which were wear, wearable. Which were not about trying to get column inches. It's not trying to be about famous or being better than somebody else. It's about doing your best. But that's what I mean, you know, and you can see it in here and you can, could see it in Paris in a few collections because I think this, my, my, si my size, sorry, my company is bigger than yours mm -hmm. and 
I'm more. I mean, that that was ruining fashion and creativity. You know, think about. We read yesterday about Julie Lebrun being ousted by yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Sonia Rickel. And it's a pity because she's a great designer she's and it's not designer, her fault that's great that house, it didn't somehow. work in two seasons, no. you know, no. like give her time. It, the, the, the next one will be ousted again because it's not the designer, it's yeah. the times. There are too many stores, there's too much stuff. So when you see shows like this or all the one we just mentioned, you really want to become a collector of great fashion, right? It's funny you say become a collector of great fashion. Mm. I wondered if you were going to say come wear great fashion. Well, I want Because actually wearing fashion and collecting fashion is two very different things. But I think if you're going to buy something like this, definitely you're collecting it. And the price that is being charged means that you are collecting it. Well, I also think that it can be both because I think about, I mean, I'm neither a collector or whatever, but I have some good stuff, you know, from the Lee McQueen's, from Nicolas at the time of Balenciaga, from, you know, my time at the Gucci Group. And uh, I will, ne I mean, I get rid a lot. I give, I sell, whatever, but there are a few pieces that I will never, and yet I wear them. Mm -hmm. And they regularly come, come out again. So I think you can, you can collect uh, great pieces of fashion and wear them at the same time. I don't think fashion belongs to museums. Well, interestingly though, just before Christmas, I was installing at the Dior exhibition, I had gone to Denver, yeah. and one of the main sponsors of the exhibition was this lady called Joy, and she said, oh yes, when I'm shopping, I'm actually collecting. That's what I do, because I have enough clothes, I don't need something to wear, but I'm collecting art. And that's how she justifies, that mentality is how she justifies spending yeah. a lot of money on fashion. Right. Yeah, lucky her she came. <laughs> yeah. But before, before going, um, I know we don't have time to do everything, but I also would like to have a quick mention on Loewe. We talked about J.W. Anderson when we mm -hmm. did our London head to head, and I, I think that he, I think that he's incredible. I think that he's doing such a good job for Loewe mm -hmm. and as much as a good job he's doing for his own brand, he's one of those that knows how to be a different designer for the brands he's yeah. serving. Yeah. Yeah. And this is Loewe. It's right for the brand. It's mm -hmm. probably right for mm -hmm. its size, public, uh, clients. And mm -hmm. it's so beautiful and so desirable. You know, he, he, he abandoned a little bit those hippie girls in whatever... Ibiza to go into women and women that want to be elegant and yeah, chic. And and certainly there's a cleanliness and elegance and if you had to sum, sum up this season there would be something They want something to look expensive. Elegance, absolutely. What did the hats, do you know? I don't know actually and I would love to know. What do you think? Um, I mean I think they're a styling accessory. Yes. Um, I don't know if so many people want to wear them but I know some people will wear them. Absolutely, but they'll probably be club kids. Um, but somehow it worked very well. It added a flippancy to and a touch of whimsy to the look, which is exactly. actually quite serious. Exactly. Um, and it's very elegant. It looks very yeah. rich and very expensive, and they are a bit of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and are they... Chinese imperial hats? No. Are they little sort of Spanish hats with horns? No. Um, are they um, mountaineering hats with ear flaps on them? Well, they're a little bit like that too. Yeah. But, but I, you know, the funny thing is about when you're designing something, you can have all those different influences, but actually what's most important is what is produced and forget all the references. What do you mean? But sometimes you, often you journalists will, say, will, will wonder, you know, will ask, so where did that come from? Where's the reference material? Why, yeah. Because that gives it a certain authority. But actually what's important is what you make from all those things, not what those things were influenced by. So the influences were not important. I understand. But obviously the clothes are not viewed in a vacuum. No. Impossible. We're just not like that. Like designers Every, don't everything, live in a vacuum. Even, even a white T-shirt is a point of reference. However, is the just it's a white T-shirt, and whatever those references are, design references, 
cultural references you leave behind and you say, well, that coat looks great because blah. Yeah, very well said. Um, I think we need to conclude, and uh, there's so much I wanted to talk about. Paco Rabanne did an amazing show. I think uh, Givenchy was an amazing show, and um, we didn't talk about Dior for once. No. But anyway, but I, I, Tom, I th quickly Tom Brown because that was quite astonishing. Quite an astonishing show. You have probably some inside about that, right? Um, turn round from his last show, which was absolutely um, uh, slammed by the critics for being insulting to women. Um, and this show was a reprise of his show 10 years ago, um, which was one of his, I think his first women's show, which was about women wearing a uniform to an office. Um, however, even though you wanted to talk about Tom Brown, what I would love to talk about- you want to say. Yeah, is about Paris's importance within the fashion business. Lots of people are talking about, you know, it really is all about Paris now, and it's becoming stronger and stronger and stronger. And, you know, Paris became important for fashion with right. Marie Antoinette. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Many years before. It's, and they've been, everything they've been doing is to underline that importance. That's why Tom Brown shows that. Yeah, if it was not the most Stella important. Yeah, McCartney shows that. that. That's uh, yeah. why, you know. Yeah. But it's, also because of the market. Yeah. Even those that don't show there, they definitely go there to sell. Absolutely. So yeah, Paris will always be Paris, yeah. like it or not. But anyway, we need to conclude, and with this we conclude a very, very, very intense season. Mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to the next already, which will happen in an eye blink. You fashion junkie, you. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for watching and thank you for following our Head to Heads. This is the last one of the season. Go back and revisit our panel discussion, Georgie, Evans, um, reviews in a car. Uh, watch us on our channel on YouTube. Subscribe and leave us your comment. Thank you very much. Thank bye you. Bye.